Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Katrina Brady, and I'm Director of Strategy and Development at the World Green Building Council. Thank you so much for joining us today live, or to those of you around the world catching up via the recording for our webinar discussion today on social value across the building and construction life cycle. So yes, today we're here to discuss an incredibly important and interlinked series of topics within the scope of social sustainability. So we'll be discussing today how we can create a built environment that's healthy for people and planet, enhances well-being and productivity, uh, creates social equity and justice, protects human rights and worker welfare, and so many more issues looking across every actor in the building and construction life cycle. A quick word of introduction for those of you who don't know us. The World Green Building Council is a global network. We are dedicated to leading the transformation of the built environment to make it healthier and more sustainable. The World Green Building Council network represents a global a collection of green building councils across 70 countries, representing around 36,000 members to accelerate action on the ambition of the Paris Agreement and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And our work is focused on three core areas, climate action, health, well-being and social value, and resources and the circular economy. Today's webinar is hosted through the World GBC Global Project dedicated to health, well-being and social value called Better Places for People. That's a little logo you can see in the corner, which is active in over 30 countries across our membership network. And the work of this global project is presented through the lens of our health and well-being framework, which you can now see on your screen, which we published last year following an extensive two year consultation to redefine the topic of health and well-being in the built environment. So today's webinar is the second uh, in a series of multiple webinars where we are unpicking and exploring key issues from within this framework. In our first session, we focused on air quality, COVID-19 um, and net zero, and you can find that recording on the World GBC YouTube channel. And today we're focusing in, we're zooming in, as you can see, on principle five, which is focused on creating social value. As you can see, this principle, which we created through a very extensive consulting and collaboration process, is about creating positive social value through buildings and communities. Uh, within that, we have details on protecting human rights, relating to health through the building and construction life cycle, committing to protecting the mental and physical health and well-being of people in the construction industry, bringing in the worker welfare angle, and providing longer term value to communities and improving local quality of life. So we will try and cover these broad topics within today's webinar. And luckily I have three fantastic panelists who we will be hearing from very shortly. So without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. Jessica Verdon is a human rights specialist with experience in managing ethical practices in complex and global supply chains in construction with a particular focus on tackling labor exploitation. She has led and managed diverse teams in the UAE and Qatar, driving human rights, ethical and transparent labour operations in order to tackle modern slavery. She developed Multiplex's first ever labour processes and procedures, and she currently holds the position of co-chair of the Global Construction Sector Initiative Building Responsibly, where she's developed industry leading principles adopted by over 40 companies to date. And as we can see, she currently holds the role of Senior sustainability, Social Sustainability Manager at Multiplex. Welcome, Jess. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. Great to meet you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jess. We'll hear from you in just a second, but let's bring in Annabelle now. Annabelle Short is Senior Advisor at the Institute of Human Rights and Business in their built environment uh, area and Annabelle has two decades of experience advancing greater respect for human rights and climate action by businesses in many regions. She's currently a senior advisor on the built environment for the Institute for Human Rights and Business and is author of the report Dignity by Design Human Rights in the Built Environment Lifecycle. In addition to her inter 
international human rights work. Annabelle has worked at the local level in New York City on coalition building for city and state level policy changes that benefit the climate, workers and communities. Great to have you here, Annabelle. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Katrina. Looking forward to it. Um, thanks to World Green Building Council for bringing me on as well. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, it's my pleasure to introduce Marquise Stilwell, who's the founder and principal of Openbox. And Openbox is a company that represents a culmination of over 20 years of experience. Marquise brings his passion for supporting diverse cultures and bringing positive change through many additional philanthropic and creative activities, from teaching at CIID and cast pilot in Denmark to creating films with the Openbox director, Peter Ringbaum, co-founding DEEM, a publication focused on design and social practice, and co-founding Urban Ocean Lab with Dr. Ayanna Johnson and Jean Flemma, a think tank that develops policy solutions for coastal cities. Marquis also serves as a board member for STAY, Pioneer Works, the Low Line and the Centre of Architecture, and plays an advisory role for Creative Capital and Riverkeeper. He is a member of the High Line Advisory Committee and a fellow at Urban Design Forum. I don't know how you do all that, Marquis, as one person. What a bio. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to have you. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Excited for the talk. Thank you to our panelists. Now, uh, we will hear from them very shortly, but one of the first things we would like to do today is bring in our participants. We would like this to be an interactive webinar. We'd love to hear what social value means to you as we will be hearing more about this from our, uh, from our panelists very soon. If you would like to answer this question, please write your thoughts in the chat box or the question box. But I'm also going to launch a poll for the second question on our screen of what is the most material element of social value for your organization or business. So hopefully everyone can see that poll now please do let us know. Now we are limited by technology, we can only give you five answers. Uh, I appreciate there are many more options, so that is why we have this open question as well. We'd love to hear extra comments. Let's give it a few more seconds, but I can see the votes coming in. And there is a clear front runner in the trends. <laughs> OK, we've had 80 percent of our audience attendees voting. Thank you so much, everybody. Let's have a look and see what you said. There's our results. Hopefully you can see them. So occupant health and productivity has come out for 75 percent of people as the most material element of social value. We did allow multiple answers, so that's why the total adds to more than 100. But we can see that human rights in the supply chain, community social justice and equity and gender diversity and inclusion have also been voted as really key issues that are material to everybody's organisations. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing that. Let's keep the conversation open as we progress through the conversation, but we can keep in mind now that our audience clearly have a vested interest in the topic of occupant health and productivity, and we need to learn more, don't we, about human rights, community social justice, indigenous rights, and gender diversity and inclusion. So uh, without any further ado, let's, uh, let's progress into the questions with our panelists, and I will encourage our participants throughout the session to pose questions for the panelists through the question box, please. Would love to hear from you. So for our first question this afternoon, we asked our speakers to share one image which summarizes what social value and equity across the life cycle means to them. A very, very difficult challenge and wrapped within that, we also want to hear a little bit about them as well. So we will start with Jess. We have her image ready here. We'll see it in just a second. But Jess, reflecting on what we've just heard from the audience, what does social value and justice across the life cycle mean, mean to you? And we'd also love to hear a little more about how you ended up becoming an expert leader in this space. Over Thank you. you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And um, 
Well, I think, uh, sorry about the image quality, but it's actually taken from a phone, um, actually from one of the workers' phone. This, this image for me really, really sums up why I'm absolutely passionate about human rights, social equity and social justice. You can see my colleague there on the left hand side, Lineage. He, he's actively closing out a, a quite a serious worker grievance where over 1,000 workers hadn't been paid for, for over three months. Now, I started my journey about five years ago in this field and I worked out in the Middle East for two and a half years. Had an incredible team, loads of humbling experiences and a lot of very hard work to develop management systems and to really tackle the nuts and bolts of forced labour. And we really built that team up to support vulnerable workers like these workers here. This is actually a labour camp in, in Abu Dhabi with a facade contractor. And we managed to, for the first time ever, develop an escrow fund to directly pay those workers every single month. It took us three months of hard graft working with commercial managers, HR managers, and then even involving our managing director. And as you can see, you know, the risks of forced labour are material things for workers. In terms, of, in terms of tackling wage payment issues, but when does a wage payment issue become a serious threat to existence via not having enough income for food, to transfer that back to your family and the risk of poverty? So again, for me, th this is really the picture that articulates um, why I'm in the field and why I'm doing what I'm doing. You'll be, good, you'll be glad to know we resolved it and um, the escrow fund is actually still in place to make sure that workers are paid directly so avoiding any of the subcontractors processes that have led to, to the abuse. It just really articulates and shows the efforts involved um, to, to really work at the, at the coalface solving these issues that we that we read about and we hear about and, and that, that, that are um, quite nicely framed in, in the, 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 the wellbeing principles that you guys have developed. Thank you so much, Jess. That's a really powerful image. I feel like you have transported us live into that conversation. <laughs> Thank you for giving us a brief anecdote of your of your time and experiences, and we look forward to hearing more from you in just a minute. But we'll hand over now to Annabelle from IHRB. Annabelle, we'd love you to explain these these images that you have for us. Over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and picking up in a way from a point that Jess made when she said thinking about what's material to workers and, and obviously being paid, um, decent living and working conditions are fundamentally material there. And I think when we think about materiality, obviously in a business sense, you need to think what's material to the business. However, um, when we're thinking about social value, I do think it's really important to think of the approach not only as what can be brought as new and additional and add on, but really recognizing what's the social value that actually might already exist, does already exist in very specific and complex ways in a community or, or in a workforce. Um, so just to kick off with a local story for me, so 10 years ago, um, each week I would interview one different person along one avenue here in Queens, where I live, um, to tell the sort of story of a year in the life of a street. Um, these four photographs here are all people who had stores along just one block. So you have Elizabeth Flores, originally from Mexico, who ran a party store. You have George Phillips, who ran a music store that had been in the neighborhood since 1922. You have Ralph and Yuri Almaz, who ran a jewelry store. And then you had Carlos and Marta San Clemente from Colombia, who ran a billiards hall sort of beneath, beneath that block. Um, fast forward five years from then, and the owner of the buildings decided he wanted to you know, redevelop them. And so all of those small businesses had to relocate. Some closed, some moved to a, a neighboring but much, much quieter block with less street flow. Um, and I have to say, I should have included the photograph of what's there now, but still five years on from then, there's a big new development that is still empty after all those years. So this example for me just really picks up the social value. You have to start with respecting what's, what's already there and in a community. Um, I'll get in later as to this is an example of, of some of the local level work that I've done internationally, just to say why I'm passionate about the idea of equity and human rights in the built environment is many years looking at multiple sectors, but recognizing on the finance side, real estate accounts for like two thirds of global assets. Um, as we know, buildings and construction account for about 40% of global carbon emissions. And 
as COVID has made maybe even more apparent, you know, inequality and equity um, are built into the, the fabric of the built environment in many ways. So my work now that you'll hear about more is a lot about um, driving for that uh, interconnected agenda. Thank you, Annabelle. What a, what a really powerful anecdote and also a great um, project that you were doing. I love that idea of, of a year in the street. Uh, so thank you, Annabelle. Let's hand over to Marquise now. Marquise is going to paint us a picture with only his words. So we can take down the slides and Marquise, we would love to hear from you now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is a, a, a really difficult question because I, I was very mindful of trying to show a picture or find a picture that represented social value and for me social justice social value is a process not an outcome and a lot of the work that we do is making sure that the outcomes of social justice isn't actually just social justice it is your ability just to enjoy your life your ability to um, be able to sit anywhere that you want to sit and and not be you know mess with or you know over policed or anything like that and so for me the, the important work that we do in creating social value is actually creating better conditions for communities to actually come together and so for us it is social value when you don't actually see <laughs> the social value in the work it's embedded in the process that we do not in the outcome the outcome hopefully is our ability to say it's invisible, it's there. Like we talk about great design. When it's great design, you sit in the chair and you forget the chair is even there because it's so comfortable that you can just have an engaging conversation. And so for us, it was very difficult for me to try to come up with a photo because I also want to make sure that everyone is clear that getting to social value and social justice is a process, not an outcome. Thank you, Marquise. And I think let's pick up exactly on, on what you've said, because I think there are some terms that it would be really helpful for us to clarify, for, for us to come to you for a definition and for your ideas on, on how this process of, of social equity, social value, justice, fairness, how they sit together. Are these terms all the same thing? What's the difference between them? Could you help us to, to shed some light on what all these terms mean? Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of times, particularly on projects that we are <clears throat> working on with the built environment, whether it's a master planning project or, or some other project that we're dealing with materials, it's one important to start off defining around what is community? Who are you talking about? Are you talking about individuals who are going to be occupying this space? Are you talking about the people that are going to be in between those spaces? Or are you talking about the larger footprint that you're actually affecting by this new built environment so one is understanding the community once you start to understand that there's probably multiple layers of community that are being affected then you can start to understand and align around what is the uh the shared value that those communities must align on and then from there you start to understand okay, what is the justice part what is the equity part of that it can be as simple as understanding uh, you know, when we're in the construction side, when we're in a built environment side, there's going to be a lot of tr trash, garbage, rubbish, right? Who's going to be responsible for making sure that young kids that are walking by, people that are, are still interacting, uh, their life is valuable and that they don't have to deal with the negative externalities of the built environment. So that's like a really small example of, of understanding the social value and the visual optics of what are we doing from a built environment standpoint. And that goes all the way to the built environment materials, who's gonna be using it, what are the other points of references that we have to understand. One last big one that we also have to understand is what just happened in Miami, Florida. Um, when we're talking about the built, you know, the building that collapsed and we're talking about managed retreat, uh, managed retreat isn't when we talk about climate change and managed retreat. It's not just sea level rise. It's also um, the integrity of how buildings are being inspected by climate change and things that are happening. And so, what does it mean for us as a community to think about people who are going to have to move in large numbers? How have we actually approached equity in regards to that? 
And it's really important. You know, when we go into a project, we start with day zero because day zero starts with alignment of language. And so for us, understanding all the different components of who is the community, what is shared value, and what does justice mean for that shared value is really important. Thanks so much. And I think your point about us needing to start aligning language and sharing language is hopefully something that this, this session can, can help us on that, on that journey, one of many steps we need to take. Thanks, Marquise. Let's bring in Jess and Annabelle onto our screens, please. Thank you so much. And I want to deep dive into some of the principles of the framework that I presented in the opening remarks. And Annabelle, I'll come to you. We, we heard in your bio that you are an expert. You have great expertise and interest in human rights across the life cycle. And this aligns greatly to principle 5.1 of the World GBC's health and well-being framework. So could we come to you for a bit of an overview, please? This, this topic's new to many people, but what do we mean when we're talking about protecting human rights across the building and construction life cycle? And why is that a problem? So glad that you're asking. I, I'd say it's a problem and an opportunity. Um, and building on what Marky said before, um, this is uh, multiple framings, multiple um, terms, etc. And I feel like human rights um, is a key part of, of this um, uh, language and has a lot to bring to the table. Um, one in the sense of sort of growing expectations for business. I feel like for people on this um, call, recognizing that there are actually, you know, you think the EU taxonomy on responsive, on sustainable finance includes a provision of safeguarding human rights. Um, there are UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So I think growing expectation that corporations, including in the built environment sector, have a responsibility to respect human rights throughout their operations. And that's both like on site and then through supply chains. Um, another thing that I found incredibly powerful is saying uh, when I'm in conversations, people are like, what language do we, how do we describe this? How do we just, you know, the other um, human with human rights as a framework that's there, um, that's internationally agreed and established. Um, and I would lift up sort of two key elements. One is the breadth of human rights issues. I feel like often in this space, people think, oh, you know, far flung issues throughout our supply chains, whereas actually really important to lift up. You know, human rights cover the full spectrum, civil and political rights, which includes non-discrimination on grounds of gender, age, race, disability, etc. Um, and then economic, social, cultural rights, which include indigenous rights, um, which was lifted up at the beginning, uh, the rights to adequate housing, which has some very specific elements even within it, like affordability, accessibility, cultural adequacy, etc. Um, and then the right to physical and mental health. Um, and so while it's not necessary throughout, you know, day to day decision making to be always thinking about things in human rights terms, it's incredibly useful international recognized legal framework um, on which to think about, OK, what are the risks that any new project or its ripple effects might have to human rights? So that's a fundamental lens that I think human rights bring as well as saying, let's not start only from the perspective of what positive addition can we make but first and foremost let's think about managing risks to people um, and which people and, and, and how and who are the most vulnerable who might be impacted by this project and then secondly still using that lens but saying okay throughout this project if we base it on uh, effective participation uh, listen to the needs both of local communities and end users um, there are multiple opportunities that you can unlock to actually have like a far more um, socially sound and, and long-term successful project. Thanks, Annabelle. And I think let's, let's deep dive now into some of those vulnerable groups that you mentioned, because you presented to us the questions that we, we want the listeners uh, listening to today's session to be going back to their project teams, going back to their design workshops, whatever, whatever stage they're in the value chain, and having those conversations that you've, that you've just mentioned. And Jess, we'll, we'll come to you on this. You, you lifted up the topic of construction workers, mental and physical health of worker welfare in your introductory words. And it would be great to hear a little bit more about, about this topic and about some of the challenges that you understand that, that workers in the construction world are experiencing from your expertise working in the Middle East region, but also more globally. No, fantastic. I think, if we think about any construction site, building, we know that workers are the ones to build them. 
And yet in most frameworks, they're always the last to be addressed and the last to kind of be consulted. And I think this is when we're talking about the cycle of exploitation. It really starts with the recruitment process. And then even when, they, when they're trying to obtain PPE, the right equipment to get onto the site, there are issues, then there's fraudulent documentation. And then when they're on site, they're facing work, issues with working conditions, uh, not not having not having not having safe place safe and healthy places to work. And when they're on site, they, they experience issues with employment contracts, particularly in the UK. This is something we're dealing with um, left, right, and centre. And then payment issues, non-payment and overtime, and timesheet issues. And then when you've had all these problems, you want to safely raise those grievances. Um, you can't because when you report that mal that, that malpractice you get backlash and so then they have to leave their sites but they're unable to leave because they're still owed certain amounts of money and they're unable to, to move due to documentation issues if you have fraudulent documentation issues but if, you need, in, if you're in the UAE the kafala system means that you have visa constraints so you're locked in in other ways and then you combine this with a high risk of COVID outbreaks on site so we know that in the UK there's been over 150 COVID outbreaks reported on construction sites where workers continue through lockdowns. So you're at higher risk of dying. You're at higher risk of getting serious illnesses and diseases. When combining that with long hour work cultures, so you're working way longer hours. Um, you're not working with any females. There's high levels of iso isolation for long periods of time. Um, and then often we've got migrant workers. So in the, in the UK context, we've got 42% European workers, but in the UAE, 80% of our workforce is from Kerala alone. So one state in India, and often very far from their family. So that vicious cycle of reinforcement where wage, a wage payment issue translate into, translate in, translates into financial vulnerability, which leads to emotional stress and increased risk of poverty. And then that poverty is a, is a mental burden to then poor mental health, which then, you know, saturation and distraction and has serious health concerns when you're on site. And then, so I, I think I just wanted to kind of capture kind of the key, the key threads of what we're seeing in terms of, of, of issues and, and problems. But what this really does stem back to is a lack of voice. And when we put that into, and when we put that into the kind of framing of social equity, it's about not having an inclusive voice. It's not having a voice to be able to, to relay these issues. And so when we want to talk about social equity and delivering those, delivering a fair, a fair place to work, security in the workplace, social protection for families, better, pro better prospects in terms of the types of jobs that we have, and social integration is, is, is super critical. And I just want to kind of lastly just, just talk about is, you know, for us to really have um, a, a building environment that reflects the, the people that are building these buildings, we need to use our voices to tackle those injustices and make sure that vulnerable workers do not slip through the net. Can I just jump in there in terms of, because definitely to all of that, Jess and I say in terms of voice, you know, freedom of association is like a fundamental part of that, but the ability to realize that varies in so much in different parts of the world. And then even here in New York City, you have a big difference between unionized workers who earn a decent wage and then predominantly migrant day laborers or in, informal workers who, uh, one guy who I was speaking to the other day, talking a voice was saying, one, um, you know, he'll often get taken even at gunpoint to work on like asbestos removal projects in New York City. Mm. Um, two, when I asked him, you know, what he had done in Ecuador, where he's from, he said he was a restorer of art and that he would have loved to find ways to kind of art, work in art restoration, you know, um, here, here and in the city. And, and, and I think, yeah, too often I think it's easy to think about, you know, groups of workers on, on site as sort of homogenous groups and you're so right Jess that kind of the more people can actually um, express their own agency and, and be seen as powerful human beings is fundamental. 100% I couldn't agree more and then particularly with with the pandemic we've seen some of those key polarities between types of workers skilled workers UK-based workers EU workers and then migrant workers facing completely different conditions in the health and well-being space I think that's an absolutely massive um, topic you've touched on. And climate migration too, to build on Marquise's earlier point around <laughs> impacts of climate affecting everything and then and certainly increasing migration as a result of climate change. Well maybe come back to that if that's okay but th I mean really powerful statistics, powerful stories. Thank you so much Jess, thank you Annabelle.
I think uh, the internet is working against us and we've temporarily lost Marquise, but hopefully he'll be back on in just a second. But uh, as we're halfway through this session, we thought we would give uh, our audience a little visual excitement and we've asked our panelists to prepare a case study to show us all a, a visual illustration uh, of a, a story, a project, uh, and a case study of some kind of social value practices that relate to the built environment with ideally solutions that we can take away, we can learn from and scale up to address social value in our projects, in our societies, as they relate to this case study. Annabelle, we've got your slide in front of us. We'd love to hear the story behind this project, if you're happy to tell us. I certainly am. Uh, thanks, Katrina. And I think it can be easy to be overwhelmed by some of these challenges. So it is fundamentally important to recognize that like any single person around the built environment life cycle chain can advocate and make changes for the better. Um, um, they might be small, they might be transformational, um, but I think that's really important to lift up. So um, first I'll draw everyone's attention to that life cycle diagram on the right, moving from land all the way through to demolition and redevelopment. And that's a touch point for action that we've developed which guides decision-making throughout the built environment life cycle in ways that respect human rights and maximize social opportunity. Um, and then together with partners, we're implementing that framework as a touch point, both at policy level, so advocating for stronger policies from national and municipal governments, from investors, et cetera, and also by putting it into practice, as difficult as that might be in specific projects. Um, so this is a pilot that we have underway, um, which is in the city of Bergen in Norway, um, where they're redeveloping a former teacher training college for um, a teacher training college into a centre that'll hold the services that the city provides for newly arrived refugees and immigrants um, to the city. Um, and I think some of the key practical insights that have come up um, through these first phases of this pilot are one, the importance of really thinking about both the end users and design decisions have been made differently depending on the, the, the needs of the end users of the space, but also local communities and how can this be a space that really fosters interaction between the people who live around and will also be using the space um, uh, together. Um, for example, having shared facilities, the soccer pitch will be used by people who are using the building and um, the, uh, the the, the neighboring community as well, for example. Um, another specific insight was when it came to procurement tendering, recognizing that the city's um, uh, template for procurement contracts didn't at the time include human rights provisions, um, but there was an opportunity to strengthen those. So we're really seeing these projects as an opportunity to build a strong team throughout the life cycle, find specific entry points and ways to maximize risk and, and increase opportunity, and then to share lessons out. So there's a strong conversation between the project itself and then the wider um, regulatory and industry space. Um, if anyone on the call is interested in learning more about being a pilot, uh, get, get in touch. We'd love to talk to you. Thanks, Annabelle. And um, what you were saying about in engagement at public procurement stage, I think is really, really interesting and um, something I will discuss with you offline. Um, absolutely fascinating. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, we were going to come to Marquise next. Let's have a little shout to see if he is on. Marquise, can you hear us? Nope, hopefully he will be able to come back and we'll be able to hear about his case study. Just a little teaser for now. Uh, but Jess, we'll, we'll come to you, please, for your case study. Fantastic. So I've got about four pictures there. And I picked this case study as it illustrates the ever close links between climate change, our temperatures and vulnerability. So this is a heat stress campaign that we led in 2019 in the UAE, which was the first time we developed a programme that brought social equity and climate change to the forefront of health and well-being on construction sites. So we know that migrant workers are particularly in the Gulf. They face huge exposure to high temperatures in the summer months due to the work that they're doing and the exertional nature of much of their work. And just for context, we know that the World Economic Forum places climate change and climate action failure as the biggest risk in 2020, with the onslaught of ramifications on justice and on social equity, but particularly for these workers that work in some of the most um, high temperature areas 
So numerous studies have shown that hazards disproportionately impact low-income and minority groups as they have fewer resources to respond and recover and also mitigate those risks. So those inequalities we know have been talked about more recently by Kate Raworth and Donut Economics and Joseph Stiglitz who've really put the earth parameters and climate change linking that with social society and the economy. And one of the biggest problems for the UAE is heat stress caused by the rising temperatures. It's the country with the highest vulnerability to climate change, humidity, drought, rising sea levels. So we really wanted to kind of, there's a few of us who got into a room, we wanted to kind of look at these risks and look how they play out for workers, their health and their well-being on our sites. And just from, from when I was in the UAE, temperatures in the summer had averaged around 40 degrees with 80% humidity in 2011 to around 50 degrees and 100% humidity for the three months in 2019. So what did we do? We developed a heat stress management program founded on measuring and reporting live um, thermal work limit data across our projects, capturing critical information around temperature, humidity, radiant heat, which is the direct sunshine that are on um, specific workers, and wind speed. We then invested in these machines across a pilot project, which generated over 10,400 data points to steer risk assessment controls and construction activity. So to Annabelle's point, really taking that risk-based approach, yielding the data to then make decisions on rest and work schedules, hydration stations, fans, um, really looking at trend analysis as to which part of our projects were hotter at different times. And we actually ironically found that most amount of heat stress cases and fatigue happens at midnight. And you think, well, the sun's not there, so why, why is that the case? But the, the level of humidity and the lack of the lack of wind has actually more of an impact on heat stress than direct sunshine. So then we were able to manage and implement specific um, specific programs and uh, rotation of work to manage these risks at different times. And we then implemented summer rest days off to manage fatigue. So really providing that time back, flexible working for exhaustion and reducing that risk of burnout. And so what did that all lead to? Well, a whole bunch of training, as you can see. Um, very, we actually employed a, um, a school teacher to help us deliver some of this training to make it accessible to migrant workers who realize that PowerPoint presentations um, are not successful um, in a very um, low, illiterate workforce. So you can see some really great pictures there of, um, of, of the teams working hard to deliver that training. And we actually found that in 2019, we we're able to reduce heat stress cases by 52% as compared to the previous year. So what started off as a climate issue quickly turned into a question of social equity and the social production of risk in terms of access to health and well-being. And when we're talking about heat stress cases, we're talking about heart attacks. We're talking about risks of, of fainting and then some serious some serious impacts to young workers in particular. So um, I was very proud of, of that work. Um, we actually ended up winning an award on it. Um, and again, we learned a huge amount in that in that process, which has now led to programmatic changes around around our UAE operations in the summer months. Thank you so much for that case study, Jess. And let's definitely come back to this link between climate change and social equity. They keep coming together in this conversation. And that's something for us to, to dive into, I think, in a few minutes. But uh, Marquise, thank you for dropping back in. Let's hope the Wi-Fi is working. We would love you now to transport us to your case study in Brooklyn. Great. So during the transition um, during COVID, we had already been spending some time in Red Hook, but we actually moved our studio down in Red Hook, and I actually um, took up some residence in Red Hook as well. Um, as you know, uh, the Superstorm Sandy had a great effect on this area, and though the, the news cycle is done with that super sand, the people who are living there are still living under the, the challenges that um, happened during that time period. And so, what we've been doing is working a lot closer with the community, really getting to know who the community is. One big part around social value is not helicoptering in or parachuting into a community and believing that you have all the answers. Um, you know, this is one part where I'm also very careful with the word expert. I you know it's I know it's, it's 
we use it in many contexts, but when it comes to community engagement, um, we're never the experts. The people who live there and who are the community are the experts. And what we do is really create better conditions for listening. And so what you see here is just a couple of slides and photos of the area in Red Hook where we are engaging. As you can see, there's waterway there. Um, the, the level of water that continues to rise during that time period. Actually, the, the building where you can see like a little train next to is actually the building where I'm living right now. And you can see just how close uh, I am to the water. And even during sunny day storms, a sunny day, what we call uh, flooding, um, that area actually creeps and there's water that actually jets over a little bit, particularly during high tide. And so what we're doing is not only looking at what are some options when we start to discuss around managed retreat? What is that actually going to look like? What does it actually look like when it comes to a lot of the construction that's going there? Who should be responsible? Um, there's a lot of warehousing that's happening in the area. So we're also discussing and working with community on that. There's also a lot of trucks in and out. And so when it comes to pollution and sound and traffic, we're also monitoring that. So we're actually doing a sound and air quality study right now to understand what is the adverse effect of construction site trucking that's going in and out, not only just to the roads and traffic and kids being able to walk across the street, but also to the air pollution. And so when you get such a concentrated area like Red Hook, uh, you start to see the challenges of construction, of trucks and traffic, and <laughs> then you add in there climate change, right? And so uh, unfortunately there are neighborhoods like this in coastal cities that are going through such tension right now that you know we're spending a lot more time to understand what are the policies, what are the actions that, that are required to actually support the people who live there every single day and are the most vulnerable. It has the highest concentration of public housing in the country. It's about 10,000 people who are living in that public housing just off the water. And so you know we know that they're a part of the most vulnerable that were hit hardest during Sandy and continue continue to be in a vulnerable place. Thanks, Marquise. And and as you've left us on the note of talking about climate change, I think let's let's dive into that. That's the direction that our topic is going. And I want to come to all three of you on this, but I'm going to come to Jess first because Jess, I've heard you say the sentence before. I hope you don't mind me quoting you to yourself, but climate change is a human rights transition. What do you mean by that? What does that mean? What are the key issues at play? Yeah, no, I, I, I honestly, this, this, this topic for me is one of the most, most material. And as I've shown you with the workers, it is becoming one of the most material issues in construction. So what do we mean by transition? Well, tra transition means to change. It means a lot of change in a very short space of time if we are to meet the net zero targets laid out that many countries have committed to to prevent the 1.5 or 2 degrees mentioned in the IPCC report and the Paris Agreement. And as we know, the built environment um, contributes to 39% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So to get to net zero, our sector will, will experience an overhaul and transformation. And this type of transformation is a revolution in itself. And when you put this in the context of AI, industrial revolution, automation, electrification, this scale of change is immense. And we know that transitions are about people, they're about workers, consumers, businesses, communities, taxpayers and voters who make those decisions that lead to those transitions and are ultimately affected to buy them. So we know that social equity is, the, is really at the heart of the transition to low carbon and resilient cities. And so from, from my work in the UK, the UK is on this journey and they've, that they have they've recently begun the government's 160 million Build Back Greener investment scheme, which aims to create 2000 construction jobs. On the flip side, what about the displacement effects? Will these jobs really be meaningful for the construction sector and who will be made redundant? And who will get these jobs? And who pays for the reskilling and upskilling? And how do we ensure that the most affected who are disproportionately located in marginalized communities, similar to what, me, Mar what Marquise was saying, these communities have their voices heard, their emotional well-being protected and vocalised so that racial and income inequalities are not exacerbated. And how do we incorporate a gender sensitive lens as the world begins to demand and draw heavily on technological STEM based solutions? And we know that STEM based solutions have historically excluded generations of young women. 
And so how do we ensure that they're, they're not left behind? And we know that the construction sector employs a mere 15% and 1% on site with the largest, one of the largest sectoral gender pay gaps. So will those be exacerbated as we move to this more STEM-based economy? So this is why social equity lens is critical as we transition towards net zero. And I think the United Nations guiding principles, protect, respect, remedy, incredibly helpful to navigate this space alongside the SDG goals and the ILO's principles around decent work, which put people, humanity and human dignity and the multifaceted impact of such drastic change at the heart of the debate. And lastly, one point I wanted to mention was that the transition to, to net zero, as Marquise has said, is a process of social change where we all need to live and work in new ways across, across the globe. And if we look at the pandemic as a great example, we know that 42% of the population are working remotely. That would not have been the case 50 years ago. So if we get this wrong and we do not bring workers, communities and their families along on the journey, we could critically risk slowing progress, leading to unrest, migration, modern slavery, social polarity, and further environmental degradation. Because we know that ecological systems, technology, the built environment, energy supplies, and people's livelihoods are closely linked to behavioral change. So to get that change, we need to be focusing on the people that are invested in that change. Thank you, Jess. I said bra bravo, Jess. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll mention all of that. <laughs> um, I guess what I, I would also just to, to add to that is understanding the changes, particularly on the gender conversation of how we're working. And so the way we work today does not always support families and definitely does not support women being on the workforce. And so, yeah, the, 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 the gender pay gap, all those things need to be coded immediately. And we need to rethink how we're actually scheduling, how we're actually setting up the working conditions um, mm -hmm. And how we are, and, and some people are like, well, do we need to accommodate? Absolutely. We need to, when, you, when we talk about accommodation, it's about understanding the process of justice when it comes to making space for people who may not have always been involved to listen to see how we might redesign the process for actually how you enter into, the, you know, literally into the construction site, the hours that are available, how we recognize that these individuals are families, right? These individuals are actually sitting on the ground, eating their lunch in a hot sun so their kids can actually eat inside of a cafeteria, so their kids can actually eat at a dinner table. This is a huge sacrifice that these workers are making and we need to create better conditions for them and particularly for women. To add on the five day work week, um, or the, on, the, on the how we think about think about um, working patterns, we've got some partners in Australia, for example, who've been advocating to just instill a, a five day work week on construction sites, and it's been extremely difficult. They've faced a lot of pushback <laughs> in making that happen, um, but have also realised in the moments they have, the mental health benefits um, are there. They're always it's, it, it's always hard to measure, but they are there. Can I just jump in with two other things on? Uh, when we're thinking climate and social equity, um, thinking about two, one other part of the supply of, of, of building projects, which is the materials side. Um, and that, that's another area where I feel like those two pieces come together in a huge way. So it was so striking to see an image by the circularity um, report last year, which showed that kind of what are the biggest interventions we can make to actually reduce the carbon emissions from materials from that we use. And reducing floor space was the biggest by far um that's why i think like empty buildings re really drive me mad because i think before uh you know before we start building a lot of, of of new let's really think about how we maximize the space that we already have is important from a climate and an equity um side that said obviously growing populations migration we need to build more um and so on the equity side um, I'm part of uh, the Design for Freedom Construction Working uh, Design for Freedom Working Group here on the here in the U.S., um, which is construction and architecture companies that have come together to think about how do we eradicate forced labor through brick, timber, stone, cement, etc. Supply chains. Um, so I'd really, you know, lift up that work for anyone who wants to check it out and join that conversation. Um, beyond the risk of forced labor, obviously there are multiple. Um, 
human rights and social impacts throughout material supply chains. So I think that as governments start ramping up infrastructure to, um, and building construction and you know to reboot their economies from COVID, really thinking about those material supply chains will be key. We're already seeing a squeeze there. So to what extent can we be really innovating in materials to actually create them more locally with the opportunities to create better jobs and at the same time um, reduce climate uh, carbon footprint as well and I know there's a huge amount of innovation in that space but the more that it's elevated both from the climate and social justice side like who has access to that jobs is is really key. Um, and, and we can add the, the way we talk about net zero but also the net positive is the supply chain including those individuals in this new wave of sustainable materials and bringing them and scaling them up on the supply chain side as well mm -hmm. is going to also be a part of what's important in this discussion. Yep. And then the other piece I wanted to pick up was from what you said, Emma Keys. I'm so glad you lifted up the Miami example earlier. Um, and when we're thinking of the life cycle of a building, I feel like it's very easy to focus mostly on the design and construction stage, but actually when you think about the human impact of a building, if it's standing for like 50 years or more, that, that is where the essence of the impact happens. And so actually really needing to think about what's the social impact during the management and use stage is key. And it's Miami, but it was also Grenfell in London. Um, it was the Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh. And, you know, they will have different dynamics, but one, repeated trend is often that concerns are raised and they're not addressed. Um, so re-lifting re up to this point about voice is the importance of when there are concerns, um, it 100% makes sense to address them when they're raised. And Annabelle, just I just want to jump in. Sorry, Jess, I'll come back to you in a second, but uh, this is a question for both of you, actually. But Annabelle mentioned the term design for freedom, which we had a couple of questions, actually, in advance of this webinar, people wanting to understand what this what this work is about. You mentioned modern slaver in the construction sector, but I think it might be helpful for us to understand what what that work's tackling, because I think there there is an element of of the unknown, isn't there? People don't know how much forced labour there is across the manufacturing of those many um, materials that you mentioned. Could you maybe shed some light on that, and then we'll go over to Jess. Yeah, so very briefly, that, that's exactly the issue. And it's interesting how we've seen it in other supply chains as well of, uh, you know, um, multiple layers of subcontracting. And it's really hard to trace where the materials actually come from in order to have any sense of responsibility and accountability for risks of forced labor and other human rights abuses through those supply chains. Um, however, we're seeing, again, sort of regulatory increases um, requiring lead companies to be reporting what they're doing about this issue through their supply chains, whether it's in Australia, whether it's in, in, in the UK and other countries, um, introducing one modern slavery legislation, but also wider human rights due diligence legislation through supply chains. So increasingly companies are gonna need to be uh, finding out where, the, where these risks are. Um, Design for Freedom Working Group was set up precisely to raise awareness of this issue and, and the extent of, um, harm to workers through constructed materials supply chains but then obviously to also figure out the way forward um, uh, and whether that's through import controls on materials that are produced with forced labor as, as one approach how do we increase transparency through supply chains is another and, and then how do we also innovate um, for, for the new forms of materials is is, is going to be key as well Thanks, Annabelle. And Jess, I'll come to you in a second, but I want to bring in a great question that we've had. We've got a few good questions coming in on the chat box, a request for contact details for people to follow up for associations. So fantastic that this information will be used so practically. But Jess, a really nice open question for you. But I've had a question from Josie and saying, in your experience, what are the biggest barriers to social value within the built environment? Biggest barriers. Um, well, interestingly, I think the well, there's two ways you can look at it. You can look at it from a systems-based approach, so the regulation to finance to business. So, are we seeing finance stepping up to fund projects that are doing great things in terms of social diversity and some in terms of having the correct board diversity and in terms of yielding some of these social value outcomes? The answer is no. So. 
in terms of that that broader systems way of thinking from from our regulators that set those social social parameters via certain acts and, and regulation to finance to business that that is one system that we're seeing is a, is a massive barrier to yield those changes downstream on construction sites to yield things like the living wage to yield things like having correct stakeholder management plans in place to yield things like having the right diversity to 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 drive those projects on the ground and, and the right working hours and conditions so that's a massive that's a massive flow i guess that, that we're seeing particularly with finance and, and not having scrutiny on where um, big finance is being spent to, to yield the right outcomes i think more within a company if we're thinking about the, the, the second piece of the pie around what are the barriers um, in companies i think again um decisions aren't made in a vacuum they're made with um then there may be seven several sets of people discussing if you aren't if you aren't having those forums within the boardroom if you aren't having those discussions coming to, to, to fruition you're unlikely to get decisions made on these topics so i think having representation at those senior levels so having an esg professional that is driving the, those outcomes internally is really really critical and so um, yeah, those those would be for me the two biggest barriers in in our industry. And and look, we we are evolving, we are changing, and we are seeing that di board diversity, for example, um, where critical decisions made on on business progress, etc., are made, is changing, but at a very slow rate. So how can we possibly expect those outcomes to happen without a different way of thinking? And I think Einstein has a fabulous quote on it. Um, insanity is, you know, repeating the same thing and thinking you're going to get a, a different outcome, and and that 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 is really the fundamental um, of, of the issue here. Thanks, Jess. Annabella Marquise, do you want to come in on that before we go to closing remarks? Thin right margin. I think thin margin, and you know, competition is is clearly a sort of reality. I think within these this industry, um, but that really does curb or make it difficult to advance some of these approaches and i'd say that's one reason why collective action and building out and working with others is is is, is one key element of the way of the way forward because i think none of us want to pretend this is easy um and yet it is also fundamental to do so how do you kind of break those blockage points um and think about the business models that enable or, or don't enable change yeah and i'll, I'll just quick soundbite is the the business model and and how we redesign incentives and so a lot of times the incentives mm. for time and, and and you know how much you spent are at conflict with yep. the changes that we really want to make and sometimes we're, we're we're doing this all at the same time going well we're trying to do this yeah but you're mm. incentivizing the other way and so i would say in, in, you know reimagining incentives is really important Really Thank point. you so much. And um, can we bring our final slide up, please, Sarah? Because as our as our final word from our audience in our last minute, we would love to open up this question again to all of you who have been, excuse me, listening and learning for the last hour. Please do get your comments in. We'd love to hear from you. What do you think you can do to enhance social value? And as a closing remark, I'll ask each of our panelists for a one section takeaway. What's the one simple thing that you think participants can do to help to enhance any of the issues that we've talked about across this session? Can you give us one takeaway, if that's okay? Fantastic, I think um, I'll, I'll jump in first. So lead by example in all that you do. So if you are a board director or you are a simple employee or you are you know, working with your supply chain and you're the commercial, lead on that project or a QS, live your values through your personal decisions and the people you employ, the policies and practices you advocate for within your companies to really ensure that human dignity, well-being are embedded. And I think if we start to insist, if we start to use our voice on, on equity related issues, we can really we can really use our leverage as, as an influence as citizens, employees and managers of people and then ultimately change agents. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say, you know, the yes and to that is just a simple framework of the head, heart, and hands, and finding a really balanced approach to the thinking of it, but making sure that we're doing it with our heart. Because at the end of the day, these are families, these are people who want to live their life. 
And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the construction workers get to go home and they're safe and their families are safe and the people who are in the buildings are safe. And so if we can align with our, our, our head and our heart and really support the hands, I believe we can get there. And mine is similar building on those two, um, but it was would be advocate. Um, and that can be advocate in your organization, even with just three colleagues, like advocate within your team and or advocate at the policy level. You know, we've seen great groups of architects coming together around climate challenges, for example, but what's can, what ways can you lean in and also lean out at the policy level and then advocate at the project level too. Um, is there a way that you can include human rights provisions when you do uh, uh, tender when you when you bid for a project for example to just raise awareness up the chain um, or if you're coming down the chain there's the way that you can embed this into contracts and into project plans to actually make it physically happen on the ground um, and as per the pilot I shared working on this on one project isn't going to fix the systemic issues but it is going to kind of demonstrate movement forward and inspire others to follow suit as well so small steps within a big, big picture <laughs> Thank you, panelists. Those were beautiful words and really clear takeaways. So I think with that, we will we will close this webinar. Thank you so much to our fantastic panelists today, to Marquise, to Jess, to Annabelle. It's been an absolute pleasure hearing from you and learning from you. I've learned so much from you in the last hour and we have talked many, many times. So thank you for continuing to shed light on these really important topics. And to all of you who have joined us here today live or via the recording. For any more information about the World Green Building Council's work on health and well-being, including the Better Places for People project, our health and well-being framework, and the other resources that have been mentioned, you can find all of that via our website, or you can reach out to us directly via social media or email. So thank you so much, everyone. A huge thanks again to our speakers, and see you next time at the next of our Better Places for People webinars. Goodbye. Thank you.